far back as May 2020, Calicane was arrested for breaking into two apartments, forcing one terrified resident to jump out of a window to escape him. He was assessed as psychotic, but after being discharged, he broke into another apartment, then stopped taking his medication. A year later, he travelled to MI5 in London and told them to stop controlling him. He assaulted a police officer. He attacked a flatmate. He was kicked out of halls by his university. He attacked two colleagues at a warehouse. The list goes on and on and on. This looks like a total system breakdown, which allowed a cold-blooded mass killer to rampage through our streets. And the bereaved loved ones of his victims now have to bear the scars of a complete absence of justice. Well, joining me now is the lawyer, writer and broadcaster, Chris Dawg, KC, Talk TV contributor, Esther Kraku, and the associate editor of The Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire. OK, let's get into this. Chris Dawg, you're a KC. Uh, explain to the British public, many of whom are completely baffled by this, how this guy can plead guilty to attempted murder and be found guilty as charged, uh, but then have his murder charges downgraded to manslaughter with diminished responsibility? Well, it's very straightforward in law, although I have to say that it's not been very well explained by the media or, or indeed uh, possibly by the judicial system. But in law, it's very straightforward. The defence of diminished responsibility, which basically arises where someone is so psychotic that their perception of reality is completely distorted, uh, they can plead guilty to diminished responsibility only to murder. That defence is not available to attempted murder as a matter of law, and why? that's why the, the difference between the two charges. Why? Uh, you'd have to ask Parliament. It's a parliamentary decision. But you're, to, you're a KC. So, uh, it, I the, mean, the, do you not share my utter yeah. bemusement at the fact that you can plead guilty in a situation like this to attempted murder, because you're attempting to murder people, but on the charge of actually murdering people, you're allowed to get away with a, a lesser charge and a cushier sentence. I mean, it just makes absolutely well, no sense. I can no, quite well, understand that, that these families believe that the law is just not fit for purpose here. Well, it's neither a lesser, a lesser sentence nor a cushy sentence. Neither of those things is well, he's true. He's not in a prison you're, cell. You're, you're, and he won't spend any time in a prison cell. He's not in a prison cell because he was psychotic. What you didn't say in your misleading introduction was that all five psychiatrists, including the prosecution psychiatrists, agreed that he only committed these crimes because of his paranoid schizophrenic psychosis. But for that, all the psychiatrists and the judge agreed he wouldn't have done any of it. So let's look at the way we're thinking about and talking about mental illness rather than, as it were, taking someone who was so psychotic that he was so disturbed he took three lives and treating them as if they're a pariah for the sake of their mental well, health. Well, I assume all mass murderers no are psychos, to be perfectly honest with you. Otherwise, they wouldn't, commit, they wouldn't commit he did, mass he's murder. He's not convicted of murder. Well, I also remember the Yorkshire Ripper, he's not for been example. convicted of murder. The Yorkshire Ripper was convicted of murdering 13 people, later identified, was identified as, as a paranoid schizophrenic, but he was found guilty of 13 murders. Well, indeed. Why? That's correct. At the time of the trial, he was undiagnosed. We were, it was a very, very long time ago. Psychiatry has moved on a lot in 40 years or so, and nowadays psychiatrists are able to accurately diagnose schizophrenia, and that's why all five doctors agreed. There was no doubt about the medical diagnosis, and there was no doubt in the High Court judge's mind that these crimes derived entirely from his mental state and why not did, from any underlying history who... of violence. OK, why did two experts who were called disagree then? They didn't disagree. That was another part of your misleading introduction. All five agreed it was diminished responsibility. None of them suggested that he was insane. Now, the insanity laws date back to the 1840s, and that's an entirely and very specific legal issue. Nobody was saying he was responsible for his actions. The difference was, is it insanity or is it diminished responsibility? They all agreed it was diminished responsibility, and that's the significance of insanity. Not to say that he was in some way competent, but because it was a, a, in the dividing line between insanity and diminished responsibility, the evidence was clear. But what I find baffling about this is that he seems to have been so calm, chillingly calm, in the way he's planned all this, getting all his weapons, nothing about his behaviour that we've seen really suggests that he's having some kind of psychotic episode from any of the video footage. This is a guy just basically planning calmly to commit mass murder. And that, again, a lot of my questions to you, Chris, are more reflecting what the public are thinking about this, which is a lot of anger it's based on the anger right. of the families. It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of more in the bemused camp, to be honest with you, um, because he doesn't look to well, me like someone is, who's not completely in control. Now, I accept that maybe the experts say he was 
a paranoid schizophrenic. But everything about the way he planned and executed this looks to the, you know, unprofessional eye, admittedly, that he is just a cold-blooded, pre-planned killer. Well, if you read the judgment, and the judge set out in great detail, he quoted from all five of the psychiatrists, he went through the entire history of this man, going back to day one, he was a very clever man, he'd obviously gone to university and studied engineering, there was there's no intellectual deficit, the difference here, and the judge explained this with real clarity and compassion, was that his belief set which was completely paranoid, was created by delusions from his illness. He believed that he had to f listen to a voice in his head telling him to go and commit these murders or his own family would be killed. He believed that to be his own truth because of his psychosis. And when people understand that's what's in his mind, it perhaps makes more sense that he's going to spend the rest of his life in a psychiatric institution rather than a prison, which, which are only intended for people... F that final sound question for you at the moment, Chris, but... Will he spend the rest of his life in a institution or is there, as I believe is the case, the possibility that he may actually get out and that would not have applied if he'd been given a full life sentence for murder? Well, that would have depended on the sentence that the judge decided, but you're absolutely right. Had it not been for his diminished responsibility, he would in inevitably have been convicted of, of triple murder and he would have received a whole life order and never been released from prison. That is true. But this particular order gives no earliest date for release and he could only ever be released if two things happened. One, a mental health tribunal decided that he was no longer a danger to the public and two, the Secretary of State for Justice agreed to his release. Now, if you just think about it for two or three seconds, the likelihood of any such scenario is so remote as to be not even worthy of belief. OK, uh, Kevin Ness, you've been waiting patiently here. Kevin, what's, what's your take? As I watched you this morning on Good Morning Britain. Um, with two of the parents, a very incredibly powerful, moving interview. And you were kind of wrestling, I could see, with your heart saying one thing, your head saying another about this. That's right, I put, my, uh, yeah, I put myself in the shoes of the parents, Barnaby's parents, and I, I would feel cheated by, by the system. But I think where it went wrong is not in the sentence, because he will be locked away forever, and I visited a secure mental hospital mm -hmm. before. You have to go five, six checks, just like you're going into a prison. I think it's why was he free anyway when he'd been sectioned four times mm -hmm. and there were warrants out for his arrest and the police and hadn't the picked him up. Yeah, I, th I think that is the failure, not the not the verdict, not the judge saying it is manslaughter through diminished responsibility. But, okay, but Esther, I mean, when you hear that he, you know, when the public hear yeah. that this guy's pleaded guilty to attempted murder, yeah. but then is not found guilty of the ones he murdered, in my mm. estimation. I think they're entitled to be pretty bemused yeah. by what the law has done here. And I think I mean, Chris, Laura's door is completely correct here. That is the law. Yeah. But the law seems to me to be inexplicable. I mean, that's what I really struggled with. How can someone who travelled from London prowl the streets of Nottingham for hours mm. not have be convicted of you know premeditating this attack? Um, but I listened to the, the the judge's comments, and then it was he spent 33 minutes explaining it, mm. and he he testified on behalf of the five um, sort of psych psychiatrists that said this man is suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. I think we also have to consider the fact that he's a danger to prison inmates as well as prison mm. wardens if he did go go to prison. I think the only justice any parent who child has been murdered would be for the person to be hung but in this country we don't hang people for having a mental illness and that's that's the really difficult thing to to take from this the fact that this person is so mentally unwell that he'll have to spend the rest of his life behind bars imagine if he becomes cognizant of what he's done he might even wish he was hung mm. because he couldn't live with himself well, he's he, murdered three well, people the, the difference of, of course about being in one of these institutions Kevin he will be mandated to take all his medication he they will. will make sure he does which you know, by all we know about him, when he took the medication, he was relatively normal, and right? Yeah, and there's a great failure in so-called care in the community, that people are really basically left on their own. Yeah. And this guy was obviously frightening, obviously terrifying to other people, and obviously a danger. Mm. But uh, the end result is he will not be on the streets. Street, yeah. He will be detained. Do we really think 
people with severe mental illnesses should be put and in you prison. know what's even worse I know, but i the, but i if, really if, am if with the parents and I, you know. if, if the cps had gone ahead with the murder charge they would have lost and then they would have to have a retrial yeah. and put the parents through more years of of the, yeah. of the slow clunky british judicial system and i don't think that's fair either lucy letby for instance you know her, the parents got a knock on the door in 2018 that someone may have murdered your baby and then it went to trial in 2023 yeah. that's five years of agony imagine if you know the, the trial wasn't as meticulous mm. as it was and they had to go mm -hmm. through another five years of that agony and i think they've actually saved the parents uh, I, I know it doesn't seem that way but they've saved the parents well, let me bring let me bring uh, chris back in here because the chairman of the criminal bar association uh, tana adkin case he said the court the court backlogs and a lack of barristers meant the reasons for the different outcomes were not explained to the families which seems to me absolutely shocking shameful actually that these poor families were completely unaware that this was all going on behind the scenes until right at the last minute. Well, if that's the case, of course, it's utterly, um, uh, it's a complete failure of the justice system. Um, but the point that was being made by Tana Adkins is a very good one. The truth is that the waits for justice are almost indefinite. And those who have been raped are waiting on average four and a half years to give evidence mm. against their attacker if they really? can uh, yeah. make it that long. Uh, four and a half years is the average, Piers, for a, a rape trial to get to trial Why? after charge. And that because the system is, as, as Tana Radkins made clear, there are nowhere near enough specialist barristers. as you can imagine, the skill and sensitivity it takes to either defend or prosecute in a rape case. There are simply nowhere near enough of them left because the government starved the system of funding for well over a decade and, and, and many, many people left the profession. And so victims pay the price every single day in our system. And sadly, in cases like this, murder cases and other cases, whether it be rape or other sorts of serious violent offences, um, the prosecutors simply don't have enough time to sit for an hour or two or three. Frankly, if it were in a council of perfection, peers, in a case of this kind, I would have wanted to sit with the family for an entire day and listen to every single problem that they had right. with the decision, justify it and explain it properly, and that didn't happen, and that's a breakdown of the system. I mean, Kevin, on every level, these families have been let down by a system yeah. that has just not been fit for purpose here. No, and it's, it's callous and it's cruel, and there they are. They're just treated as spectators mm. while they've lost a loved one. Look, they, they should be taken through every step and involved. It has to be explained. Maybe they'll object at times. You would understand that. You have just had your life totally changed in the most gruesome and horrific way. But the, the, the system is, is broken. broken. It I is. Mean, it's you, absolutely broken. If you think broken, about it, if you know. take your child to, to a specialist and say, my child has depression, they have to wait over a year just to see someone. So if you think about the lack of medical yeah. health resources that we have in this country, it's no surprise that someone like this, two I weeks before what when Chris just said about a four workers. and a half year average wait for yeah, a rape there's, case. Well, there's no justice, yeah. and that will explain why very few rape cases ever result yeah. in a conviction. Yeah. Because people, people give up, they just spare they don't want to bring the claim mm. in the first place mm. look the, you know, the the system is is broken when the it's system smashed. works you got to make it, it work. works i i i absolutely stand by Brit the british judicial system i think when it works it works it's just slow and clunky and underfunded and unfortunately i think the the prosecution uh, knew this and they wanted to save the parents years of agony and you know what the british public i can tell you uh they're, they're going to feel the same way the families have felt. Yeah, well... Which is betrayed at every yeah. level the, by the system, but also inexplicable that he can be simultaneously convicted of attempted murder, but not of murder. Yeah. No yeah. one's going to understand that. I'm sure that is the law. I know it's the law. Chris has confirmed it's the law. It's just the law's an ass. Because yeah. if the public can't understand yeah, well, yeah. something that simple, yeah. then it has to change. I just don't think anyone can hear that and go, what? It makes no sense. And if I was one of those parents, I'd be, but I'd be furious. Look, look, mur murder is intentional killing. I mean, cr Chris Stoll explains yeah. better. It's, 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 it's intentionally going to kill somebody. Manslaughter is unintentional. Well, what's attempted murder, then? Well, you attempt to kill somebody, but you don't do it. But if you... No, but you're deliberately well, attempting to kill why, them. Why isn't there a case of murder by, you know, sort of... I mean, I, I, thought, you, I thought it would be a murder You're murder mentally case. ill as you do it. He, look, he... But traditionally, it would have been a murder case, and the mitigating factor would be his mental health issue. Yes. That's what yeah, most yeah, people yeah. would expect. Well, let me ask Chris one final yeah. question. What is to stop Chris, somebody in a, who's, who's just a killer, playing the, the mental health card, saying, I'm a paranoid schizophrenic? I mean, what's to stop them doing that? 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you what to stop them. There's two things. Firstly, both the prosecution and the defence get expert reports from not one, not two, but a total of five of the most senior forensic psychiatrists in the country who deal with psychotic patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Secondly, there's a High Court judge who has to make the overall decision. He weighs all of that evidence and he considered very carefully whether there was a possibility. He explicitly referred to it. Is it possible that he's, as it were, swinging the lead or that, that somehow this is fabricated? And the judge said the, ab the, the possibility of that was so slim that it was, it was not even worthy of consideration because of the expert opinion from so many different places. But you do make a good point, Piers, which is that you do need intent to kill to commit attempted murder. Right. And so uh, I can well understand why people are confused because actually the defence of diminished responsibility should be available to both. Makes absolutely no sense to me, and I'm sure not to many people. But uh, Chris, I appreciate you joining me. Thank you very much. Uh, to Kevin, Esther, thank you very much in our hearts go out to all those poor families. I can't think of anything worse in the world than what they've had to endure.